Well, good morning and welcome to South Point where we're one church in multiple locations. I wanna say good morning and hi to our Leonardtown campus. I wanna say good morning and hi to our Lusby campus. Let's give them a little fist bump. Hey, Lusby, so glad that you're with us. We wanna say hi to those of you watching on our YouTube channel or watching on the web. We're so glad that you chose to be with us here today. Hey, before I dive into anything, I wanna say something to some, if any of you here at any of our campuses are watching online or here this morning, I wanna say something if you're new or you're not a follower of Christ, Today is a little bit unique and special, so I wanna make sure you know we don't want anything from you. You get to see how much you matter to God, and because you get to see how much you matter to God, you'll get to see how much you matter to us. You see, we're in the last week of our series called Launching a Legacy. This is our kind of our last week of our official Launching the Legacy, um, and this is probably the most significant moment today in the life of South Point Church history. And here's why today is probably the most significant moment in the history of South Point Church. Because you and I, we live in a busted and broken world. And when I say that, I think many of us forget how truly busted and broken the world that we live in is. I mean, if you don't believe me, all you have to do is watch the news. All you have to do is read the newspaper. Matter of fact, every day I check the paper. I believe that church people should not hide from the world. I think we should be engaged with the world. So every day I, I kind of read the newspaper. And when I say the world is busted and broken, here's an example of what I'm talking about. Yesterday I was reading the local Washington Post, right? Just here in our local area, right? Our DMV area. And there was an article about this, this, this group of people, this mom, this daughter, and this other mom. They got in an argument over who was a better parent. Um, and the, the fight kind of escalated and it got so bad that the mom and daughter doused the other woman in gasoline and set her on fire. That's kind of where we live it. And, and I, could, I could recite to you 10 stories that reveal the brokenness and the despair. I mean, mass shootings are the norm in America. Las Vegas, Pennsylvania, Charleston. We don't just have that. I mean, oh my gosh, we have a national opioid epidemic and with Southern Maryland right here, our local area in Lusby and in Leonardtown is smack in the middle of. Race relationships are pitifully poor. And I personally believe that the church is supposed to lead the way in reconciliation. I mean, politically, there's hatred and hostility and division. I heard a story of family members defriending each other on Facebook over politics. We live in a world where girls and boys and men and women are trafficked for sex and destroy lives. We live on a planet where a third of the planet lives on less than a dollar a day. We live in a world where children die of starvation and die of simple things that they could have the cure for. And I could, get, like, listen, I could go on and on and on. I could just break out the post and read you stories. It's enough to make anyone want to hide their head in the sand and just ignore it. Or, you know, what we do, we distract ourselves with entertainment and consumption. But in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this destruction, in the midst of this despair, there's a reason why we were singing. There was a reason why there was joy this morning. You see, there's a hope today. There's a hope, and listen, this hope isn't found in religion. This hope isn't found in an organization. This hope isn't found in ritual. This hope is found in a person, and his name is Jesus. And you know what we get to do today? Today, we get to do something special. Today, we as a church, whether you're at Lusby or online or at this campus, today as a church, you know what we get to do? We get to plant a banner in the ground and we get to commit to per creating a permanent place that will honor Jesus and that will bring heaven up there, down here on this earth. Today, we get to say we're gonna build a permanent place that will launch hope and life into a world that is in desperate need of it. Today, we get to create a legacy that will impact generations to come that will honor Jesus if we choose not to hide or consume. You see, we've been saying from the beginning of this series launching a legacy that we have a God-given mission. And we kind of say it this way, and I want to repeat it, and I understand you might not like it, but it's the truth. Listen, the church is not a club. Listen, this isn't Burger King. You don't get it your way. Listen, the church is not a clique. The church isn't about being with people who look like you, talk like you, and think like you. 
The church is a community. That's why we have, that's why we have Stephen's ministry so that when we're hurting, we can get help. That's why we offer counseling. That's why we have Celebrate Recovery for people who have addictions. That's why we have small groups. We're a community to be connected, but we're a community on a... Listen, we have a God-given mission. The church does not exist for itself. It exists for the world around it. And if you're looking for a club or a clique, this is the wrong place. But we have some obstacle to our God-given mission. Listen, at our scale, at our size, at our age, being totally portable in both of our campuses limits our resources. It limits our opportunities. It limits our excellence and it limits our growth. In short, what it means is it limits the people that is our mission. People is our mission. And we're limited by being totally portable. And so we have a plan, and I'm going to put a picture of the property up here. Our plan is to create a permanent home on our property. And this is not a hideaway. This is not a place to huddle. We love our Lusby campus. We're going to keep it open, and we believe we may open other campuses. But we need a permanent location in which to launch God-honoring change that lifts Jesus up. Yeah, that, I'm fired up this morning. You and I have a once in a lifetime opportunity to create a legacy. And you know, when I say the word legacy, most of us kind of think, well, what is a legacy? A legacy is something good that you get passed on or that is passed on to you or that you pass on to someone else. And this morning, you and I are gonna get to hear a story that throughout the whole story, there's a theme of legacy weaved in and out of someone who actually is a part of South Point. So we're gonna dim the lights. We're gonna hear this story if you'd give your attention to the screens. I remember growing up as a little girl in Ghana. Um, with always being in one church or the other, I think we were always brought up in the Lord. I remember my mom always dressing us up for service and depending on which auntie or uncle or cousin we're going with, we ended up in different churches. So sometimes for that week we go to a Catholic church and some other time we go to Apostolic or Methodist or Anglican. And depending on whichever auntie we're going with, and sometimes one auntie was always favored because we, we asked her whether they're going to serve any snacks at her church. So she lets us know, okay, this Sunday there's going to be snacks, and then all the kids in the house, you know, go with that auntie. So that's how it's always been. One day she heard on the radio about a church that was that had their services between seven to nine. It was kind of like two hours or three hours there about. They said, oh, I can do this. It means I can still go to church and come back and still get everything done. So she dressed us up, and for the first time, I saw my mom also going to church. Well, we went to church, and then they said, okay, who are the first timers here? And then myself and a group of other um, adolescents stood up, and then the pastor, we exchanged names and he said, okay, welcome and all that. And he said, okay, well, we have a tradition here. First, first time is get a gift, actually for three, three consecutive times when you show up to church. And then when we were asked to go back to our seat, he called me back out of everyone else. Okay, now, here's the Bible and the, the badge. Which one do you want? You can pick any. Then I reached for the Bible. And I was so happy. And when I was walking to my seat, I kept wondering about God. I'm like, wow. It was just between my mom and my siblings, miles away in front of our apartment, that I complained about that huge Bible. And I was embarrassed to take it to church. And here is God offering me the perfect size that I needed. It just showed that he cared about me. Like, you know, the things that concerned me concerned him. Like, it didn't matter what it was. It was completely different from what I've known. I have lived outside the country before in the UK, but it was still a new experience. And at least with my husband, he had his friends all there customers that he deals with at the workplace. He had his colleagues to talk to. 
but here I am, I didn't know anyone and close families that I knew were far away in Gettysburg. So now I'm pregnant and it was time for my son to be born. And it had to be born to an emergency C-section where they put me to sleep. Now, exactly a week after I had my son, I still hadn't seen him. And I was still recovering from the C-section and I kept praying, praying for him and just wondering when I'll get to see him. I finally get to see him one week after and I held my son for the first time. I was able to touch him, I was able to kiss him and it was on my birthday. And so every other weekend, when my husband is off, we would drive all the way to get his bag. And it was quite a journey. And on the way with the screaming baby and having to stop several times, you know, before we get there, and sometimes even getting there late, it was beginning, even though we had fun there and everything, it was, it was beginning to be a bit challenging. So I began to search for churches online every week. We go, we try a new church. Sometimes we go, I have fun, I enjoy it, I love it. My husband hates it, he doesn't like it. We go to a different place, he loves it. I'm like, no, this is not for me. So finally, one time, my friend, a friend of mine said, oh, I just saw South Point Area and I also saw South Point Church. And we decided to give the church a try. So the first time we walked in, I think it was during the county fair era. We walked in. I went to sign my kids up. They gave me the sticker and all that. And each time the, the red flashing numbers came on the screen, I checked to see if it was my girl because from past experiences, it was always there. But each time I checked, it wasn't my number. I'm like, wow, what is going on? So we go through the service and I loved worship because the first thing that grabbed me was the worship team. And during then, it was Curtis who was singing and he's with the Lord now, but I'm like, wow, I want to be part of the worship team because I'd always been in one worship team or the other. Now, I go back to get my little girl and they said she didn't cry. And for the first time in years, I had if it was just one hour to myself, I'm like, oh, I'm definitely coming back next week. <laughs> Even if it waits for me, that was my mommy time, so. so. He goes to work and he gets home, it's like, oh, one of my customers said, they go to this church, they have it in the school. And at a South Point church, then I started laughing. <laughs> I'm like, really? So next week I'm off, I want us to go give them a try and see. So the, the week after we go to church, and he liked it. And again, they didn't have to call me to come for my Isabel. And the kids loved it there. So right away, I joined the worship team. And it was during that era, they said, okay, we'll be having our baptism. And I said, well, it's about time. And finally, after all those years, I got baptized and that itself was, was a wonderful experience too. And we've been in South Point ever since. I think it's been four going on to five years now. And like every other family, it is not perfect, but that's one thing that I love about that because all of us are, we all have our differences, we all have our, our shortcomings and the purpose of the church isn't for us to come in perfect, but for all the mis imperfect people to just rely on God and the Word of God to lead us to where Jesus wants us to be. So that's the reason why we're still in South Point. Well, South Point, this is my good friend, Thelma. She shared her story. We're so grateful uh, for her being willing to share her story. Um, you know, uh, the great thing about Thelma is, is we'll talk about legacy in a few minutes throughout her story, but 
Um, Thelma wants to leave a legacy and not just consume. So even though she has three kids and that sometimes her husband works on the weekend, Thelma serves regularly on the worship team here at South Point, both at the Leonardtown campus and at the Lusby campus. So we are grateful that she's a part of our community. So I'm going to ask you, Lusby, even if you're watching online, I'm asking her on time, can we stand and can we pray for Thelma and Dominic and their family today? That would be a great thing that we could do. All right, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Thelma. I thank you for her story. I thank you for the legacy of her aunties and uncles, God. I thank you for the legacy that she's leaving, and I thank you for the legacy that is being passed on to her children, God. I pray for her and Dominic. I pray that you would bless their family and bless their marriage, God. God, I pray that you would do things in their life that they could never imagine because they said yes to you. Thank you that for the gift that they are to our family here at South Point, to this community local, God. We are blessed to have them. We ask that you would keep and bless them. And we pray all this in Jesus name. Amen. Let's give her a round of applause. <clears throat> we can see all through Thelma's story that there was a legacy. I mean, think about it. What created the foundation of faith in Thelma's story? It was her aunties and uncles. And I love the part of the story she said, she wanted to go to the church with the best snacks. And I go, that's why we have donut holes. <laughs> I love that. I love that it was her aunt and uncles that, that kind of pass on a legacy that is a foundation of, of faith. And then built into the story is, is that here at South Point, when she walked through those doors, someone had created a legacy where South Point is a diverse church that is loving and welcoming and accepting and creates safe space for all kinds of people. I mean, she came from a different country. When she moved to this county, she didn't have a community. And there was a legacy of community and diversity here so that when she walked in, she felt welcome. Think about the legacy that is getting passed on to her children. She said, even if I just got an hour free of mommy time and didn't like it. My kids stayed back there and were impacted. Can you imagine? We don't do daycare back there. Kids are getting to hear that there's a God who made them, a God who loves them, and a God who wants to be their friend. There is being a legacy created for the next generation. And then Thelma herself decides, listen, I'm not going to sit here and just consume. I'm going to give back, and I want to be a part of the legacy that this God is doing, regardless of how full and busy my life is. I'm going to give back. All through her story, we see legacy weaved in and out of her journey and her story. And her story and our story teaches us the truth this morning. We're going to put it up on the screen, and you've experienced and I've experienced. Listen, everyone's story includes a legacy left by someone. I mean, I think about my own story and the legacy left by my adopted parents who took me in when I had no place to live. And I bet if you thought about your story... There's a family member. Maybe it was a grandparent. Maybe it was an auntie. Maybe it was a brother. Maybe it wasn't a family member. Maybe it was a coach. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was a best friend. But I bet if you think about your story, there's someone who left a good legacy. And as you think about them and the legacy they gave you, there's a smile that warms your heart. Now, here's the scary thing about a legacy is that it goes both ways. You see, regardless of whether we choose to leave a legacy or not, all of us will leave a legacy. Nod your head. All of us will leave a legacy. And just like we can think of a story and of a person who's left a good legacy in life, I bet we can all think of people who've come into our path or into our lives who've left a legacy of pain and of hurt and dysfunction. And the reality is, is that today, whether you say yes or no to the mission of God, all of our lives will leave a legacy. The real question is, is what kind of legacy will you and I choose? What kind of legacy will you and I choose to leave behind? And here's the most amazing thing. Did you know that we're here today because of the legacy of a couple of guys? I mean, at Lusby, if you're watching online, wherever you're at, there were a couple of guys who were in a significant moment, and they didn't realize they were in this moment, but this moment altered and launched their life in a different direction that left a legacy that they never, ever saw coming. And we're going to pick up this moment in the eyewitness account, and we're going to put it up here on the screen. It's the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. 
And when he, he being Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Simon who later becomes Peter, he says, now go out where it is deeper, out in the water there on the boat. And he said, let down your nets to catch some fish. Now, I want to stop here. You need to understand something. Peter, or Simon, is a generational lifetime fisherman. So his father and his grandfather and his grandfather before him, I mean, for generations have been fishing in the water. And here comes this preacher named Jesus. And he's out on his boat and, and Jesus tells Peter, hey man, you should like throw the nets out on the other side. And Peter's like going, you are, you're whack. Like, this is what I do for a living. I'm a fisherman. You're a preacher. You should stick to preaching. We'll pick up the story. Master, Simon replied, he's like, listen, I get that you're a rabbi and everyone hangs on your word, but, but we've worked hard all last night. Like, listen, we do this. We know when to catch fish. We worked all hard. We didn't catch anything. And then he's like, I'm going to humor this guy. But, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And we pick it up. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Now, this is miraculous. You need to understand something. This has never, ever happened before. Nothing like this has happened ever in their life. They've never heard a story of a fisherman's nets beginning to break because they were so full of fish. And they began to shout for help from their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and they were on the verge of sinking. Matter of fact, not only were the nets close to breaking, they filled the boats up with so much fish that the boats began to sink. Something was happening. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, I mean, he's a generational fisherman. He understands that only God could do this. Filled two boats that were sinking? Never. He fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, leave me. I'm such a sinful man. Kind of like the song we sang, Reckless Love. I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it. It's probably things that we've all said to God before, like, if you only knew, God couldn't love someone like me. That's what Peter was saying. Hey, hey God, hey Jesus, you couldn't love someone like me. You should probably step on away. And I love the response of our Savior, Jesus. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that he had caught, as were the others with him and his partner, James and John, and the sons of Zebedee's, and they were amazed. Jesus replied to him, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left. Oh, come on. Come on. We can do better than that, okay? As soon as they landed, they left. And they followed. They followed Jesus. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I'm a pastor, and I've been following Jesus since high school, right, right after high school. And I've, I've read this passage a hundred times. And I don't know if you've ever, like, read a passage in the Bible, but you kind of just, like, you get used to it, and you just keep reading over it. And, like, it was about the hundredth time that I recognized that something pretty amazing happened. Because I probably wouldn't have responded the way that Peter would have responded. And here's why. Like, I just had the catch of a lifetime. Do you know how famous? Do you know the, the fish stories? <laughs> you know the fish stories that I could tell about the day that, I, that the nets almost broke, that we filled up two boats and we're generational fishermen. I could compete against the other men. I would have the greatest fish story of all time. Like, why would I leave that? And then just think about the economic. This was the greatest haul of fish that they ever, ever had. That was money right there. They were like, look at this. We have some money. We're going to have fame. Why would I ever walk away from that. And all of a sudden, about the hundredth time I read it, I realized that these guys walked away from a story they could tell from a lifetime and a boatload of money, literally, to follow this one named Jesus. And I had never thought to ask the question, why? Why? Why would generational fishermen who could hang their hat on the greatest catch in this boat full of money walk away to follow this one named Jesus? And then it hit me. They realized something. They realized that no matter how good the fish story would get, it would never be better than that story. And they realized the fish on the boat would get old and stinky and they would be eaten. 
and they would have to go back and catch fish again. And no matter how great the fish story, they would have to go back out and catch fish again and catch it again and catch it again. But they said, if we go with this one Jesus and we can impact people, we can leave a legacy. We can change the world and impact eternity. And just maybe, just maybe, my life can count for more than something than just catching fish. Which leads me to my opening observation this morning, if you're following along in the insert, and it's this, everyone, everyone wants their life to count. Every one of us wants our life to count. Listen, this is why when we're growing up, we love stories. This is why we love comics. This is why we love movies. It's why we love plays. It's because growing up, we want our life to count. We realize that the things that we do, especially adults, adults smile, adulting's hard, right? We look around and go, who's more adultier than me to adult? So I don't have to, but then you realize you're the adultiest adult in the room and you got to get it done. And we want to do more than something to do work and bring home a paycheck and then eat it all up and spend it all up and go to work and get a paycheck and then eat it up and spend it up and, and we just do the same old thing. Everyone wants their life to. We dream of being the hero. We dream of our life leaving a legacy. We dream of our life actually counting. However, life, life comes along. Life will come along and just tell us that we're a cog in the machine and that our life won't count and that our life will never, ever make a difference. And sometimes it's not life that comes along and tells us that our life will never count. Sometimes it's our choices, right? I mean, I know I've made choices. I thought there's no way I'd ever be a pastor. And if I had had a cell phone when I was younger, I might not be a pastor. But sometimes life comes along and it says, no, 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 your life won't count. And then sometimes we're really honest, it's our choices. We've made choices. We've made choices we knew were wrong. We knew it'd create hurt. We knew it'd create pain. It'd harm ourselves, it'd harm us. We knew it was wrong and we chose it anyway. And so we go through life and we go, listen, I want my life to count, but between life and my choices, my life won't count. And all I have left is entertainment consumption. And then comes my most favorite word in all the Bible, but God. And if you're watching, or you're at Lusby, or you're here, and you think because of life or because of your choices, your life count, I want to say to you today, but God, but God, which leads me directly into observation number two, which is God invites you God invites me, God invites we to partner with him. It is the crazy, it is the cra it's crazy. I don't get it. Why would God ask busted and broken people to partner with him? But he does. This is miraculous. This is mind boggling me that Jesus doesn't save us by his death on the cross, his, his resurrection, his conquering death in hell. He doesn't say, listen, just hold on till I get back. No, no. He says, listen, I want you to partner with me on bringing heaven up there, down here. I actually want you to be me on this busted and broken planet. I go, that is crazy. Have you met us? <laughs> and some of you are going, there's no way. Well, let's just look at what the scripture says. The apostle Paul, who actually used to persecute the church, the only reason he became a follower of Jesus, he encountered a risen Jesus, and he planted a bunch of church. One was in Ephesus, and he writes this group of people that's a lot like us, and here's what he writes them. He writes this to him. He says, listen, we're gonna put up there, for we are God's, I don't wanna stop here. I understand, I, I get it. Like, I grew up in a busted and dysfunctional family, and I never heard that I was God's handiwork. And maybe there was a grandma or a mom or a sibling or a coach or a teacher who told you you were junk. And I want you to know that is a lie from hell, that you are God's handiwork. And in Christ Jesus, you were created to do good works. Not in ourselves, not to earn it, not to deserve it, but because we were made to have dignity. We were made to have purpose. That thing in you that wants to count to do good works, which God prepared in did you know that God has got a plan for your life to count? He invites you and he says he has a plan in advance for us to do. Before you were born, God had a plan for your life to count, for your life to do something, to bring up there, down here. 
that's mind boggling. When I learned that, I said, there's no way, have you met me? And now look at me, you're listening to me. <laughs> which leads me to observation number three, which is this, creating a legacy isn't about being great, it's about being, because if we are really honest, you go, listen, listen, Matt, I can't talk like you. Well, that's okay, I don't sometimes wanna talk like me too, because I can't keep my mouth shut, right? And we think it's about being great. Well, I, I didn't, I, I'm not great. I didn't go to seminary. I, I didn't grow up in church and, and you don't know me. I don't have talents or abilities. And so I can't do anything. God can't use me. So I, I just, I'm not great. And so, and I can't do that. And, and listen, I want to say something. Listen, this is the best part. Listen, don't miss this. Listen, you don't have to be great. Smile, turn to your neighbor and smile. Especially if you ate a breath mint, right? Listen, here's why you don't have to be great. God's got the great part covered. Can someone say Amen. See, the God we serve is great. He spoke the universe into existence. He was so alive and so good, death couldn't keep him down. And he created a way for us to come back to life. Listen, God doesn't need your greatness. He's got that covered. You know what he needs? He needs our willingness. He's got the great part covered. He'll step in and do what only he can do. But he wants people who are Look at the disciples. They had been rejected in kind of the industry of like church work and, and Pharisees and their kind of culture. And they were said, nope, you're not good enough. You're just, you're good enough to be fishermen. Yet Jesus chose them and they left all. And we're talking about Jesus today because of the legacy that they left. And you wanna know how ordinary and unschooled they were? We pick it up in Acts 14. They had healed a guy and the Pharisees and the religious people heard it. They were saying it was Jesus who did it. And they were all worried because they were the ones who crucified Jesus. They said, hey, listen, we're the ones that put him into the Romans so the Romans could crucify him. Like, hey, stop talking about him. And then here's where we pick it up. We're going to pick it up here. And Acts 4, they said this. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized they were. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. You can do better. They realized they were. They were unschooled, ordinary people. And I think sometimes when we read the scripture, we began to put these guys up in the pedestal, but they were just unschooled. They were ordinary, everyday, God, the ordinary, everyday people in the house, right? Come on, that's us, ordinary people. And they were astonished. They said, look, how is God doing that through ordinary people? The, the religious leaders were amazed and they were astonished, but they had took note that these men had been with See, that's the great thing when you're with Jesus. He's got the greatness part covered. He just needs the willing part. See, you and I don't have to be great. Jesus is great. See, that's what I love about following Jesus. He does all the amazing things. I just have to be willing. And he does the rest. Everyone wants their life to count. God invites you and I to have our lives count. And he's not looking for greatness, he's looking for willingness. And today, as we talk about the significant moment that South Point finds itself, where we have a choice, we can rest on past success and we won't be required to sacrifice. We won't be required to give or to serve or to do anything. Or we can choose that our God-given mission to be a rescue community is worthy of our generosity and our sacrifice and our service. It will require something of us. And so if I had to sum it all up, I'd sum it up something like this. The kind of legacy that counts. Because listen, we're all gonna leave a legacy. Whether you say yes or no to this mission, doesn't really matter. All of us are gonna leave a legacy. But a legacy that counts, well, that happens when we unselfishly, when we say, listen, I'm going to unselfishly invest in the life of others regardless. No strings attached. I don't have to get anything back out of it. It's not for, it's for, and this, does, this isn't my idea. Like, and you guys are like, wow, that's deep. Like, no, it's Jesus. We pick it up in the eyewitness account of the gospel. John, here's the words of Jesus. Jesus replied, this is about before he's about to go to the cross. This is about before he willingly allows them to crucify him and he conquers hell and death. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. And he continues and says this. He says, I tell you the truth. So I need everyone to stop. 
The only person to conquer hell and death is telling you that there's a truth. I tell you, me, us, we, I tell us the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains. See, when you and I take our little life, and we take our life, and we take our time, and we take our talent, and we take our treasures, our finances, and we go, mine, 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 I'm going to keep it all for me. Then it's a life lived alone. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, that doesn't do any good. But it's death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful har harvest of new lives. You see, when we give ourselves away, as Christ gave himself away, we leave a legacy that will impact generations and generations and generations. And that is worthy of our best. And I want to say something because some of you might be going, well, like, you know, are, is this like leaving a legacy? Is this something that we hope to do? Listen, this is something we're already doing. Did you know just in the last 60 days here at South Point, 20 people have made first time decisions for Jesus just in the last 60 days. Like get fired up. Last Sunday at our baptism, our biannual baptism, we baptized 31 people last Sunday. Did you know that we have over 40 small groups connecting people in relationship and connecting people to Christ that happen all through the week? And it's not just people that attend whose lives are being impacted. Did you know that because of your generosity and your giving, South Point financially partners with organizations like InterVarsity that is down at St. Mary's College and they're leading kids to Christ. That's a legacy that South Point is helping to change. Did you know that we're financially engaged with an organization called Young Life that is Reaching high school and middle school students who will never walk through the doors of church. Did you know South Point Church is financially partnering with and working with Pregnancy Care Center that works with young ladies who are single and thinking about you know, terminating their pregnancy and giving them life-giving truth advice. Did you know we're partnering with organizations like Hope? When people can't pay their bills, they can go there and they have the system to process that. You are partnering to impact that. Did you know that we do things like Operation Christmas Child? Did you know we do Compassion Sunday? Did you know we partner with a mission in Guatemala. Did you know we bought a townhouse and are renovating it so we can impact an under under resourced community? Listen, when I say leaving a legacy, this isn't something we're hope to do. This is something we're fired up and we're doing now. <laughs> this is our mission. We will keep doing it. The real question is: is will you be a part of the legacy that God wants our mission to do? So the moment has come. Now in a couple of minutes, the worship team's gonna come up and we're gonna sing a song and you'll have time to prepare your Kickstart offering. You'll have time to prepare your three-year commitment above and beyond your pledge. But I kinda wanna walk us what that looks like and so we're gonna put a picture up. If you did not receive a commitment card and you need one, a pledge card, if the ushers will come by, we'll have pens and uh, commitment cards if you need one. And so here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna put this up. You see the Kickstart offering, if that is something that you considered and said yes that you're gonna do, you just wanna fill that amount out. And if you're using a check, if you could just put in a little memo, Kickstart. If you're giving digitally or online, you can just identify that. And then where it says pledge to give, you just wanna put the amount and whether it's weekly, monthly, or yearly, please fill out your information. And then you'll see on this side, there's a, li a little tear part. You tear that up, you put it in your wallet. You can kind of put it in your mirror. You put it wherever you want. Um, and then we'll, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of how to do that later. And if you're watching online, you can give at www.southpointforyou.com backslash pledge. Okay, so you can do that. Um, and then listen, here's something pretty amazing. Did you know that there are some people here at the Leonardtown camp campus, there's some people at the Lusby campus, there's some of you even online who've already turned in their pledge cards, you've already given digitally. We still want this to be a sacred moment for you, so here's what we're gonna ask. You can just put a D for duplicate right here um, so that when we have our response time, that can be a spiritual moment between you and God. Now, before we go to the time where we have a little bit of time to respond, uh, do you see the lights behind me? Do you remember this was what was on stage in week one? And there's a pretty cool story because each one of those lights represents the over 900 people who've made first time decisions to say yes to Jesus in the last decade plus. 
our staff person, um, we have a staff guy named Tim and he has a little daughter named uh, Kylie. So Tim was making this and he was making sure that it worked the night before we were going to bring it up to Sunday. Um, and it was dark and it was late and it was his daughter's uh, bedtime. And so she goes out to say goodnight to her dad and, and she comes out and she's a little brother. And um, so they walk out and she sees all the lights and she's like, Daddy, what are all those lights? And so our staff person, Tim, turns to her and says, well, Kylie, these lights represent each person that has said yes to Jesus. And in typical five-year-old fashion, Kylie goes, well, Daddy, where's mine? And then Tim is being, you know, a wise staff person says, well, Kylie, you're five, right? And, and you, you know about Jesus, but we want you to make a decision when you understand what it means to actually follow Jesus. And then kind of in her five-year-old self, she kind of, you know, kind of looks and goes like this. And she goes, okay. And then she says these words, well, save a space for me. You know what this whole thing is about? Saving space for the next generation. Saving space for adults and students who need a safe place to hear that there's a God who made them, a God who loves them and died for them, and a God who wants to be their friend so that they can come home as sons and daughters and that their lives can count. Let me pray. God, that you would invite us into this mission is amazing. God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts as we prepare this. As we listen to this song, God, I pray that if we've not responded yet, that we would respond. God, if there's something that you want us to do that maybe we've been fighting with, God, I pray that you would hear our hearts. And God, for those of us who have already come prepared, I want to say thank you for moving on the hearts of people. God, may you see our hearts to honor you to build a permanent place that will leave a legacy in a busted and broken world that will launch hope and life, not in religion or organization or rituals, but in the person of Jesus. For your word says that if we lift Jesus up, he will draw all people unto himself. That's what this is all about. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.